Well, how many of us like being told how to use our money? <laughs> if someone came up to you and told you how you should use your money, most of you would probably respond with, excuse me? Um, that's none of your business. Uh, how I use my money is of no concern of yours, especially if I've worked all my life for the money that I have. Now, for most people, how you use your money, whether it's little money, which all of us would say, yep, <laughs> not much, or much, is a private affair. In other words, if the money belongs to you, then you, how you use your money is up to you. It's yours to spend, it's yours to invest, it's yours to give, it's yours to waste. But when we open our Bibles, we discover that what Jesus says about how we use our money is very different than most people might say. According to Jesus, how we use our money reveals what we really believe about God. Now, you've probably heard the expression, put your money where your mouth is. Another one is, money talks. In other words, what you say may or may not carry much significance, but if you've got money backing up what you're saying, it actually says something. For example, let's say you begin telling people how passionate you are about Ford trucks. Some of you are probably saying, no, not Ford trucks. Some other kind of truck, maybe. But some of you would say, I'm passionate about Ford trucks. And you tell people how much you love Ford trucks. And you tell people how great Ford trucks are. How Ford trucks are better than any other vehicle. How would people know that you're truly passionate about Ford trucks? Well, first off, have you bought a Ford truck? Do you have Ford paraphernalia all over your house? Have you invested in Ford stock? If none of these things is true in your life, then are you really passionate about Ford? It's highly unlikely. The same thing could be said about your view of God. How do people know whether or not you are passionate about God? How do people know whether you are committed to God? How do people know that you have a genuine faith in God? One of the ways people know that your view of God is right and your faith in God is real is going to be how you use the wealth and the resources under your control in this life. This morning we will see Jesus sharing with his disciples the approach to life that we must have when it comes to the use of the wealth that we possess. So please take your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 16 this morning. Luke chapter 16. If you don't have a Bible with you, we do have uh, chair Bibles beneath some of the chairs in front of you. And you can grab one of those and turn to page 1205. Uh, Luke chapter 16. And we will be looking at verses 1 through 9 this morning. So I'll give you a second to turn there if you haven't turned there already. Luke 16, verses 1 through 9. Begins here in verse 1. He, talking about Jesus, also said to his disciples, There was a certain rich man who had a steward, and an accusation was brought to him that this man was wasting his goods. So he called him and said to him, What is this I hear about you? Give an account of your stewardship. For you can no longer be steward. What's the job of a steward? Well, probably most of us think uh, when we hear the word steward about someone who goes up and down the aisles on an airplane and hands out peanuts. But that's not the kind of steward we're talking about here. That's not the kind of steward that we read about here in Luke 16. Uh, this kind of steward has the job of managing the affairs and the resources of his master. So his job is to make sure that his master's resources would be invested for the best returns. 
He was to make sure that any business he did on behalf of his master resulted in getting the best deals. Ultimately, the best kind of steward is the person who would be doing what was in the best interests of his master in every aspect of his control. But what are we told about the steward in Jesus' parable? Was he that kind of person? What was he doing? Well, he was accused of wasting his master's goods. Now, is that the kind of steward you want working for you? Uh, you have an employee that's in charge of your, your finances, and you find out he's wasting your money? That's the kind of employee you want, right? I don't think so. You want a steward that you can trust. You want an employee that you can depend upon to use your goods well. And clearly the master has lost all trust in his steward because look at what he tells his steward in verse 2. He says, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your stewardship for you can no longer be steward. You're fired. You're being dismissed. Turn in your books because your time working for me is done. Apparently he is guilty. You don't see any pushback. And you also see that he's worried. Verse 3, the steward says to himself, he says within himself, What should I do? Uh Uh-oh! My master is taking the stewardship away from me. And here's a problem. First of all, I cannot dig. Right? It, it, It appears that he's an older man or someone who's not very physically fit. And so he can't go and make a living by the sweat of his brow and the labor of his hands. I can't do that. And secondly, I'm too ashamed to go out and be a beggar. Like, who wants to do that? How is he going to provide him for himself once he walks out of his master's house for the last time? Dilemma. But he has an idea. And you see the idea in verse 4. He says, I have resolved what to do, so that when I am put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. I may not be able to provide for myself, but I can do something so that others will feel obligated to provide for me. So in verse 5, he hatches this scheme. He calls every one of his master's debtors to him, right? people who owe his master money or resources, and he says to the first, how much do you owe my master? And this one man said, a hundred measures of oil. If you calculate that out today, that'd be about 900 gallons of oil, of olive oil. So he said to him, take your bill and sit down quickly and write 50. Then he said to another, how much do you owe? He said, a hundred measures of wheat. That's about 1,200 bushels in our calculations. And he said to him, take your bill and write 80. So what's the steward doing here? On his last day of work, he's slashing everyone's bills. Well, it's kind of nice if you're on the receiving end of that. He's giving everyone who owes his master a very generous discount on their bills. And so he says, you owe 900 gallons of olive oil to my master, right? A hundred measures. That's about... $38,000 worth of olive oil today? Congratulations! Now you only owe half of that. You owe 1,200 bushels of wheat to my master? That's about $7,200. Congratulations! You only owe him $5,760 worth of wheat. The steward has been fired. But he has not yet brought the account of his stewardship back to his master. He still has the books. And yes, he's going to turn them in, but he has this chance. Before he does, he's going to hand out a few favors. So for each person who owed his master, the steward rubbed off or scraped off the actual amount owed. Right, The the type of uh, material he used for his bookkeeping was either parchment or papyrus, something that you could easily scratch off or rub out. And he would change it, put a new amount in its place. 
And the master would have no clue as to what the original amount was. Right? That was the steward's job. Take care of it. My hands are free of it. I can do other things as the master. So the master doesn't know what the original amount would be. There were no temporary files backed up on a computer where he could go back and find the original numbers. Right? You couldn't get someone like Paul to go in and do his, his magic on the computer and find it. And the master certainly couldn't go around and increase what his steward had decreased. Right? It's like, I think, I think he owed me more than that. How would he know? So the master couldn't do anything else but to honor what the steward had done. And it would certainly hurt the finances of the master not to recoup everything that had been loaned out. But since he was getting fired anyway, the steward didn't have anything more to lose by shortchanging the master to benefit himself. And it's interesting you see what the master thinks about the conduct of his steward who's on his way out. What does the master view his steward as in verse 8? It says that the master actually commended the unjust steward because he had dealt shrewdly. And let's make sure we're clear on a few details here. This is a bad guy. <laughs> let's not be confused about that. We're not in any way to view the steward as a role model for our children. Jesus specifically calls this man unjust. Right? There's no question about that. He is an unjust, unrighteous man. His conduct is bad. He should have been careful with the resources of his master, but instead he wasted them. And when he was told he was out of a job, he took last-minute advantage of his position, and he cheated his master out of the debts that rightfully belonged to him. So there's nothing about this man's management of his master's resources that's being commended here. All right? So we're clear on that, right? He's bad. What he's done is bad. There's nothing good that he has done. However, there is something that is being commended here, isn't there? What is the master himself praising the steward, unjust though he has been, what is the master praising him for? For his shrewdness. For how shrewdly he acted on his way out. In the final moments of his stewardship, this steward used the means available to him to secure a welcome by others in the future. Jesus goes on to say in verse 8, something that is intended to transition us from the parable to the truth that he's going to focus on this morning. He says in verse 8, The sons of this world are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of light. That's a very interesting statement. And perhaps maybe a confusing statement. Because it sounds like the people of this world are smarter than the people of God. And in some way, Jesus is saying that is correct. And let's see what he, he means by that. Linking this to what the steward has done, this is what Jesus is getting at. Because even from the conduct of this unjust, wasteful steward, there is a concept that the follower of Jesus needs to learn. A concept that the world actually gets. What concept does the world understand better than the people of God? The world understands how to use wealth and resources to set themselves up for a secure future. They know how to deal with each other in ways that will benefit them later on in life. They know how to achieve a future life of comfort. They know how to work and invest in such a way now so that later they can enjoy a life of ease. The sons of this world, they get that. The people of this world, they understand that. This concept of using your wealth and resources to benefit you in the future 
is a concept that the world actually gets better than the people of God in many cases. But there's a monumental difference between how the people of the world live out this concept and how the followers of Jesus are to live out this concept. The people of this world, they know how to use wealth and resources to benefit them later on in this life. What is Jesus saying that his followers are to use their wealth and resources for? For benefits later on in this life? When should the followers of Jesus expect to see the benefit of their use of wealth? In this life? When? In the life to come. Jesus is saying in verse 9 here what is essentially the truth that we need to grasp today. Jesus says in verse 9, and I say to you, right? You see what we've, we've said in this parable? We see that the, the sons of this world, the people of this world, get this concept better than most of the, the people of God. But here's what the people of God can learn and need to learn. He says, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon. The word mammon is actually a, a word just carried straight over from the Aramaic. It's the word mammonos, which can literally be translated as wealth or property. So Jesus is saying, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous wealth, that when you fail, they may receive you into an eternal home. A few questions here. Let's see if we can answer them. First of all, why does Jesus call it unrighteous wealth? Is Jesus saying that wealth is inherently evil? Is that what Jesus is saying? I mean, I, have, I don't have very much money in here, but I have a dollar bill. Is this dollar bill evil? Right? Am I evil because I just touched it? Does it rub off evilness on me? Is this, is this evil? Would money be evil, for instance, to set aside so you can pay the rent or the mortgage? Uh, what about the money you used to buy a car that you used to come here to gather with God's people today? Is that money evil? I think we understand that that's not what Jesus is talking about here. I believe that Jesus is emphasizing something else about money. I believe that Jesus is emphasizing to his disciples the inseparable connection between wealth and the unrighteous world around us. Those two entities are tied intrinsically together. Great wickedness has been done in this world in connection to money, hasn't it? I mean, every day you look on the news, another crime involving money hits the headlines. It could be bribery one day. It could be blackmail. It could be robbery, fraud, forgeries, embezzlement. I mean, the list can go on and on. There's no, no number of crimes that are connected to money. So much so that Jesus is calling his disciples' attention to the very great potential that money has in leading someone to commit all manner of unrighteous deeds. Yet as Jesus reminds his disciples of the unrighteous potential that wealth has in the sin-cursed world, he knows that his followers will be living and dealing with the world's money. Right, so that money has great potential for evil. Right? Much is done that is evil over money. And so therein lies its unrighteous taint. But it's also something that the people of God is going to use to make their way through this world, to engage in different affairs of this world. But the disciple of Jesus will not use the money of this unrighteous world the same way that the world does. He won't. She won't. The disciple of Jesus, Jesus says in verse 9, must use whatever kind of money 
he comes in contact with to make friends. Which brings us to another question. What kind of friends is Jesus saying his disciples need to make? Remember the reason of the unrighteous steward back in verse 4? What does he say? He says, I have resolved what to do so that when I am put out of the stewardship, they will receive me into their houses. Right? This is why I'm doing this. Whoever they are, they'll receive me into their houses. In Jesus' parable, the unrighteous steward used his position over his master's resources to make friends so that when he lost his livelihood, they would receive him into their houses and return the favor that he showed them. That is what Jesus is telling his disciples to do. Accept the kind of friends that the disciples will be making are not going to be receiving them into the temporary dwellings of this life, are they? The friends that Jesus tells his disciples to make are, you might say, friends that will receive them into everlasting dwellings in the life to come. Use the wealth of this world, Jesus says. Use the wealth of this life to make friends that will receive you forever in the life to come. So what friends is Jesus referring to? What friends are the only ones who will give you a reception into the everlasting dwelling place in the life to come? You could say that there are three friends who are also one. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In other words, I believe Jesus is telling his disciples to use the wealth of this unrighteous world in a way that makes friends with God. Just to be clear, that doesn't mean you put a lot of money in the offering plate. That makes you a friend of God. You can't buy your way into God's friendship. That's not what Jesus is saying here. But... The follower of Jesus is the friend of God, and he will use his resources to demonstrate that friendship. Friendship with God in this life, my friend, is all that is going to matter in the life to come. The unrighteous steward of Jesus' parable knew that his livelihood was coming to an end, and so before it ended... He made friends that would receive him after it ended. In the same way, the reality is for us, our livelihood, if you want to call it that, is going to come to an end. The day is coming when our wealth and our resources are no longer going to be available to us. Do you know when that time is? Well, I know one firm time is when we die. When we die, all we have is going to be gone. And all that we've saved and stored up and worked for is going to be snatched away from us by the unmerciful hands of death. Do you remember Jesus' parable in Luke chapter 12 about the rich man who planned to tear down his barns and build bigger ones so he could store up all his wealth and goods for many years to come. Remember that? It wasn't too long ago we, walked, we worked through that passage. This rich man told himself, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease. Eat, drink, and be merry. Kick back. Relax. Now you can live the rest of your life for yourself. And do you remember what God said to him? It's pretty unforgettable words, isn't it? God said to him, Fool, this night your soul shall be required of you. Then whose will those things be that you have provided? 
And Jesus concluded that parable with these words, so is he. This, this, the same person is a fool who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. That's the truth that Jesus is building on here in Luke 16. Right? We don't want to take this independently of what Jesus has said. Right? And as I've encouraged once before, if you want to get a good feel for why Jesus is saying what he's saying here, go back and just read what Jesus has taught all through Luke's gospel. Right? You just, just look at the words in red and you'll, you'll get a feel for how Jesus has come to say how his disciples are to use their money. The Father of Jesus knows that this life is not to be wasting the world's wealth and resources on himself. The disciple knows that. As a follower of Jesus, my wealth and resources, whatever it might be, my wealth in this life must be used for God and his purposes and his will alone. What does the Apostle Paul say there in Philippians 1? We've all been through it fairly recently. For to me, to live is... What's the answer? It's Christ. So if my life is Christ, does that not also extend to my money? It does. Jesus says back in Luke 9, 25... What profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost? So the question that we need to ask ourselves this morning is, are we showing ourselves to be friends of God by the way that we use our wealth? Some of us have greater wealth. Some of us have very little wealth. But what does our use of the wealth we have reveal about our view of God? What does it reveal about our relationship with God? Is God truly the Lord over our lives? Are we truly submitting to God with our lives? Are we genuinely trusting in God and his word? Do we actually believe about God what we say we believe about God? What does your use of your wealth say about your view of God? Because, my friend, that is going to be a very likely indicator. Now, we'll return to this topic, Lord willing, next Sunday, because Jesus isn't done dealing with his, with his disciples about their use of wealth. But I do pray that this opening word we receive from Jesus this morning is clear. The disciple of Jesus, right? If you consider yourself a disciple of Jesus, this is for you. The disciple of Jesus will use his wealth for the benefits and the blessings that God, his friend, will give him for eternity in the life to come. We will not seek to use the wealth that we have in this life for ourselves. We're going to use it with an eye to eternity. So is that true of our lives? Is that how we look at the money in our bank accounts? Do we look at it and we say, this must be used for God alone? And we'll unfold more about that in the weeks to come. Let's pray. Father, thank you for our time today. Lord, this might hit in our hearts very pointedly. But I do pray that in every area that you reveal to us in your word, you would help us to submit. You would help us to bow our knee to your sovereignty and your lordship. And Lord, this is yet another way in which you call us to serve you. It's another way in which you call us to submit to your rule in our lives, Lord. Our resources and our wealth, it belongs to you to be used for you. And I pray that you'd help us to grapple with the truth that Jesus is teaching this morning. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.